Uh, this is my first slide. So, all of you can identify these animals. A Jekyll, a Nilgai, and a Peacock. Is there anybody who has not seen these around your colonies or houses in Delhi? There is nobody. Because everybody has at some point at least seen a Peacock. Perhaps a Nilgai and a Jekyll too. But uh, this next set of animals, has any of you seen any of these around your houses in Delhi? The first is a Indian crested porcupine, the second is a hedgehog, and the third is a desert monitor lizard that can be up to five and a half feet long. Have any of you seen that? No, we haven't. But the fact is that just like there are peacocks, chickals, and even new guys in the forests around and inside Delhi, there are also porcupines and there are Indian monitor lizards and hedgehogs also have been spotted in the late 80s and 90s in areas adjacent to Delhi and there are times when people say hey there, there is some strange animal and we all wonder whether it's one of these and the purpose of my talk and what motivated my talk is that there's an area of wilderness near my house and I've seen that being cut and destroyed and I've seen animals running helter skelter and I've asked myself that just like we got to see porcupine, just like we got to see uh, monitor lizards, will the next generation also get to see them? And the answer sadly is perhaps not because, because almost all areas of wilderness around many of our cities are earmarked for development. Nobody says that we are going to destroy this wilderness and get rid of all the animals, but the fact is that to live and to survive in an area of wilderness, which need not be a forest, it could just be an area uh, which is empty land, which has bushes, maybe it's a huge plot of land owned by the government, maybe it's owned by some builder or private party, and there will be animals and ecosystems existing there, because of which a monitor lizard can raise its babies, a porcupine can live munching on bushes, and peacocks and other animals can live. But when an ecosystem gets destroyed, all these animals are forced to search for food outside. Their babies are not safe because predators will eat them. Maybe they'll get caught, captured by humans and sold as pets or made into traditional remedies. Lots of things can happen, but the fact is that once an ecosystem is destroyed, it's almost a given that in the next four or five years, animals will die out. And, and that's, that's the reason I'm talking, because it's my hope that talking about these issues which are uh, local to almost every city in India and to most cities in the world will help raise awareness and some of us will take some steps to make sure that a couple of years from now, not all the ecosystems are destroyed. And even if ecosystems are being destroyed, there's a critical mass of people who are aware of what constitutes an ecosystem in a city and who try to preserve it. So the next slide, this shows a set of food chains and ecosystems. All of us, when we were in school, learned about these food chains, that the deer eats plants, the tiger eats deer, and so, that's the food chain. That if there are no deer, the tiger will die of starvation or it will be forced to attack humans. But in real life, a food chain looks more, much more like the pyramid on the left. The reason I'm saying it looks like a pyramid on the left is because more than the exact pictures of the animals, the fact is that for a primary consumer in a food chain uh, to exist, it must eat maybe 10x uh, of its own body mass of vegetable matter. Uh, for a secondary consumer in a food chain to exist, it must eat maybe 10x of its own body mass of insects. So this bird that eats insects, if a bird grows up in a ear to be to weigh one kilo, it would have eaten between 10, uh, between 10 kilos to 100 kilos of insects. And the insects in turn would have eaten maybe 100, if it, 100 kilos of insects have been eaten by birds, they would have eaten one ton of vegetation. 
so that they can support uh, one kilo of birds. And when you have a tertiary consumer, uh, you, you can multiply that by another 10. That if there's a snake that's eating 10 kilos of birds, that means that you can multiply it and you can know that there are thousands of kilos of, of plants uh, and insects being eaten. And so when you have a woodland, when you have a space and bushes are cleared, flower beds are planted, grass is planted, all in the name of development. That, hey, there's this area of rough land and you're going to make a beautiful path out of it. Chances are that the insect population will plummet. If earlier there were, say, a million insects living there, you'll end up with maybe 10,000 insects living there. So you have one hundredth of the earlier insect population. And even those will be under stress because each time a new officer or a new gardener comes, he'll say that we have to clear off these insects so that our plants can grow unimpeded. When the insects are cleared off, the, the local reptile population, like garden lizards, like, uh, like skinks, a skink in English is what we call a sapti mossy in Hindi, which is a small snake, snake like reptile. And that is what peacocks eat, apart from lizard and apart from snakes, which is like a legend that peacocks eat snakes. And if you, if you wipe out the insect populations, these reptiles will not be able to live. And chances are that the peacock population will also plummet. That the peahens will lay eggs whose eggshells are weak because peacocks can eat grain, which people feed them, but they also need protein. And that protein comes from reptiles which feed on insect populations. In theory, a peacock could also eat insects, but peacocks, if they can find small reptiles, small rodents, they eat those. And so, when you turn a woodland or a area of wilderness into a park, or you decide to get rid of the bushes, chances are that the insect population will plummet, the reptile and rodent population will plummet, and as a result of that, the jackals that you see once in a while on your morning walks, or the peacocks that you see, will die. There are also mammals that are mostly silent, like, like porcupines. There's an area of jungle that I've been walking since childhood. And in one particular month during the COVID-induced lockdown, there were stray dogs there, all of which had been injured badly. And then somebody examined the stray dogs closely. They realized that the stray dogs had been poked with porcupine quills, which meant that there were porcupines living there. And but a few months later, uh, that jungle was cleared, made into a park. And one can only wonder what happened to those porcupines. Maybe they went on to roads. Maybe if people like me who've been visiting that jungle for 15 or 20 years since we were kids have never seen porcupines, that means they were so shy that maybe they just hid themselves and starved to death. Who knows? And uh, that's what happens when you clear away the bushes, turn an area of wilderness into a park, you end up destroying the ecosystem and ultimately that leads to the demise of wildlife. And some people will say that, hey, why are insects needed? Why is wildlife needed? I would say that wildlife is needed because that is what actually gives flavor to that place. If I have a nephew or a niece and I'm taking them to a park, when they see an animal, when they see a living being, they get a sense of empathy to it. They learn about its habits much better than they learn in a book. I myself know that I did not know up till I was around 30 the difference between a porcupine and a hedgehog. I used to think, okay, maybe in Britain they have hedges, so they call this animal a hedgehog, and in Africa they have jungles, so they call it a porcupine. Until somebody showed me a porcupine quill, and I said, but how is, what about hedgehogs? So that person explained to me that a hedgehog is more like a mouse or a rat, which has spines on it. And a porcupine has quills, which it can eject to as a self-defense mechanism. And if I, who is reasonably educated, reasonably aware, have been into watching wildlife and watching wildlife movies since childhood, learned about this when I was in my early 30s, where will children who are from a less affluent background learn about it? Where will our next generation, kids who live in 
villages and urban areas right next to the jungle. Some of the jungle might be fields acquired from the villagers by urban authorities for the purpose of development or the purpose of green area. Where will those children learn about the hidden wildlife of the cliffs on the edges of cities and areas of wilderness? I think our future education will be robbed of all those lessons. The Neil guy, people say, is the largest antelope in Asia. Now, I have seen them since childhood because when we go through a jungle, we once in a while just see a Neil guy run past us. I have learned and spent a lot of time reading about how Neil guys' habits and grazing and browsing habits are different from cow and how they are similar to cattle. And I would not have tried to learn these things unless I had a chance to regularly get glimpses of it since childhood and have my curiosity tickled by it. And I think our next generation will be robbed of all these lessons if our areas of wilderness are turned into, are sort of cleared to plant grass, to plant flower beds, to use horticultural techniques that were developed in Britain and Europe and during the 1800s, the late 1800s, the Europeans like to have access to sunlight because Britain does not get enough sunlight. In India, eight months of the year, the sun is so intense that we need trees and tree canopy to protect us from sunlight. But many times, uh, when a area of wilderness is being cleared and trees are being planted, they say that, okay, let's do a canopy raising exercise. Canopy raising just means that if there is a tree canopy above the area you work, you walk, either they raise it 15, 20 feet high, or they just clear off the tree canopy so that the sun can shine where people are working. Now, this is a horticultural concept from a cold country where sunlight is a desirous thing. Uh, what about Delhi? What if you cut off the trees about a path through a woodland or through a wilderness where people walk? The birds, incidentally, Many of them make their nests exactly above the area humans walk because they are quite sure that the predators who are scared of humans will not attack the birds there. If the birds make their nests inside the jungle, the, they are much more likely to be attacked. And what kind of predator will attack a bird? Even monkeys, which we feed fruits and bananas to, they also are opportunistic scavengers and opportunistic eaters of eggs and animal matter. So if a troop of monkeys is going and they see a bird's nest with eggs in it or with chicks in it, it's quite possible that they might just grab it and eat them up. And if you cut off the branches right above where humans walk, chances are that an entire ecosystem, an entire bird population over the span of just two or three years can get decimated. I'm going to now show you actual photos of places which I saw as being hidden ecosystems and places which I saw as being hidden ecological disasters. Because when you think about the ecosystem and you see a place being turned from a park, piece of wilderness into a manicured garden or a manicured woodland or a park, chances are that the ecosystem is getting destroyed. So here goes. See, uh, this is a jungle. The jungle is partly cleared. But this tree that you see is a tree called Vilaiti Kikri, which in India is regarded as an invasive species. Because they say that Vilaiti Kikri, which grows faster than Desi Kikri, spreads like a weed and it prevents native species of plants from growing. The plant, uh, which this, the Vilaiti Kikri incidentally, does not have a cover uh, or a foliage like what we see in this. The reason you see this foliage is because there is a species of bush called a zizipus, which shows something called phenotypic plasticity. That if it's on the ground, it will grow like a bush that is growing next to the ground. But if it has trees around it, chances are that it will grow like a vine, wrap itself around the tree, and the entire tree will be covered with the bush. Now the beauty of this is that people often can walk past on the ground, and on the tree canopy, very dense tree canopy, is not from the invasive species which is Vilaiti Kikar, but it is from this thorn bush, Zizipus, which has covered the Vilaiti Kikar. And because Zizipus is a native bush, it has evolved to show phenotypic plasticity because grazing pressure of, of leaf-eating animals like eel guy, even porcupines which eat leaves, 
this is first is one of the favorite wishes for them to eat so as a but if you cut off this tree you say that hey this tree is a invasive species we have to remove all the reliable features because uh, this is the standard operating procedure of the forest department or agriculture department chances are that the bush will also get destroyed and when the bush gets destroyed there are going to be lots of reptiles lots of insects even monitor lizard that live there i'm fascinated by monitor lizard because each time i've seen a monitor lizard go past me i shiver and i get goosebumps of fear because i've seen monitor lizards that are literally 5 or 6 feet long and like a mini crocodile they are walking on the ground uh, i'm fascinated by jackals because i learned once that jackals do not live on the ground they take the burrows of rats and other burrowing animals and then they build a system of burrows under the ground which has multiple entries and exits and it even has a area which is a nursery area where the baby jackals are kept a jackal has a area where it can store food and animals it kills so that the babies don't go hungry it has air holes and emergency exits and many times if you plow a area of earlier bushy land the jackal burrow will just collapse sometimes we hear poo 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 voices coming from under the ground and i wonder maybe these are baby jackals on top of which the ground has collapsed and they have no sign sign of escape i once saw an area where bushes were cleared and a jackal was roaming around like it had gone mad like a man who has lost his house and i later thought that maybe the burrow has collapsed and its babies are underneath because i had never before seen a jackal linger in the same area for 5 10 20 minutes even 50 hours and i heard of elephants digging for 10 hours to save their babies but this jackal which is normally shy maybe it has lost its babies so 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 that's what motivates me to give this talk in the hope that edx being about local issues and local communities my talk will raise a level of awareness this is also an, an understated ecological disaster because where you once had vines thorn thorn bushes which i talked about in the previous slide covering the trees and this mound it had more bushes under which perhaps there was a jackal burrow and this was cleared and now grass is being grown Uh, there are tree saplings being planted, and perhaps the flower bed will be put. But to me, this is a site of an ecological disaster because bushes that were growing for decades, which had animals, reptiles, and ecosystem living under them, has been destroyed. The one on the right side, which is a slide I had previously shown, uh, which shows a variety of creatures covered covered with resinous bushes, that also is an ecological disaster because the undergrowth and the vegetation around these trees has been cleared uh, and uh, there's not much more to say because i think all of you have understood the the crux of what i am trying to put forth to you this is a new guy and uh, this new guy normally we used to see it from a distance and we would never be able to look at its size but this space the place where the new guy used to live has been destroyed and so the new guy is grazing somewhere where it would not normally go and it's just very scared of me it's trembling and it's just lost in its own place which was once its home so i will end my talk with this quote that i think uh, all of you can carry back with you as the main take away from this talk we do not inherit the earth from our parents and ancestors we borrow it from our children because whatever we have of the earth and whatever we give to the earth is what the next generation will take off as the earth if we let jungle vegetation ecosystem wildlife be wiped out uh, uh, that is what we are passing on to our children so let's act now and let's not miss the forest for the trees the reason i say let's not miss the forest for the trees in english is a proverb that don't focus on the nitty gritty and this is the big picture in this case literally areas which were densely bushy you cannot count bushes as a forest maybe by indian bureau standard but areas that were bushy that supported ecosystem are being destroyed just so that trees can be planted and some official somewhere some bureaucrat can say that hey we have met this tree plantation goal and we have planted 100 trees here 
But what of the animal? What of the wilderness? What of the ecosystem? And that's 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 all I'd like to say. And that's why my talk was called wildlife, ecosystem, wilderness, and parks. And these things are things that I think we all must know. Thank you so much.